Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where we burned our shadow selves at the stake and lived to tell the tale. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hitting the old play button on this one. You picked a good time to do it, too, because this time around, we welcome Scott Gosnell into the house. Scott and I will be discussing the life and death of Giordano Bruno. Of course, Bruno is one of the reasons you are hearing my voice in the first place, so it's really cool for me to be able to chat about his life with Scott, who may be the preeminent Bruno scholar here in the States, or worldwide for that matter. Scott has translated four volumes of Bruno's writings from Latin and Italian into English, and it's the first time these works have been translated into English. How cool is that? How he came to do that is also a cool story that we'll talk a bit about as well. This is also a bit of an experimental episode, at least in terms of the format and preparation that went into this behind the scenes for me personally. It may not be that noticeable as a listener, but see if you can pick up what I'm putting down. And what I'm putting down is a story that's not so much about Bruno's ideas as it is about him and the road he traveled to even arrive at those ideas and some of the characters he may have encountered along the way. So let's sit down, strap in, and cast this pod off deep into the infinite universe where heretical thoughts and shadowy ideas stoke the alchemical fire necessary for personal renaissance. Enjoy! So, Scott Gosnell, thanks so much for being here, man. Thanks for having me, Ryan Peverly. (laughs) No problem, man, no problem. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. We've been chatting on the Twitter for a few months now, and uh, you're a pretty diverse individual, and we'll get to that in a moment, but... I wanted to start with something a little different, you know? I wanted to tell a bit of the Scott Gosnell origin story because of that diverse background, and I didn't want to peg you as, you know, just the Bruno guy and ask that standard, you know, where's the interest in Bruno come from question. But, you know, if I don't start there, I'm not entirely sure where to start. So I thought the best place to start was in left field with a a bit of a fun role-playing scenario. So just stick with me here for a moment as I lay this out, all right? Okay. So you're a young, up-and-coming casting director who just got hired to cast this fantastic art housey type of film about Francis Yates. This has been one of the hottest scripts on the blacklist for years, and now it's finally being made. And there's a lot of pressure on you to get this casting right. You know, major career implications here, for sure. So the major focus of the script is specifically the period of Yates' life when she's researching her two most well-known books, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition and The Art of Memory. Now, the cool thing about the script is there are specific moments from Bruno's life that while Yates is researching them, we flash back and see them as full scenes in the film. So not only is the casting of Yates important, so too is the casting of Bruno's. You essentially have two lead characters here. So the question is, Scott, who do you cast as Yates? And more importantly, who do you cast as Bruno? Wow, that's a that's a tricky question. You know, a while back I was working on a project that would have involved one of the characters being actually Giordano Bruno. And we had kind of settled on, for our first choice, Pedro Pascal, who uh, played uh, Oberyn the Viper, Oberyn Martell on uh, Game of Thrones. Because he, he sort of has that combination of Wicked intelligence, but is also capable of seeming, I guess, threatening or seeming, you know, having kind of a sharp tongue. You know, you could go with with other other people who do that kind of character well. So this would be the sort of thing that, you know, you would you would call up Benedict Cumberbatch for, but he's not really right for the the role physically, because you think of him and you think he's sort of tall and bean polish. And Bruno was kind of a shrimpy, you know, five foot two, five foot three guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, they used to make fun because, you know, he was he was so short. So you might, if you were looking at like a young Bruno, uh, I just watched Call Me By Your Name and Timothy Chalamet would be a, would be a great choice because he's sort of, you know, a little, little skinnier and, you know, a little more contemplative and just getting started in the world. But I think Pedro Pascal would be a great choice for an older Bruno. Gail Garcia Bernal would be another good choice, I think. Who who would you pick? That, I, I was thinking about Pascal as you're talking about him, and I honestly am more of a fan of his work in Narcos. Have you seen that? Show? Yeah, yeah, I've so, seen a little bit of it. Yeah, 
so as you're talking about him, I'm thinking of him in Narcos. You're talking about him in Game of Thrones. And I think this is a perfect choice because that shows right there that he has range as an actor. But yeah, you know, I guess if you're trying to go authentic with, you know, like you're talking about Bruno's stature, I don't know any actors that would be able to to physically, I think, portray him no matter what the age is. You've got to find somebody who has a lot of like, it's hard to fake intelligence on screen. Now, Yates is also tricky because there's sort of a version of Yates that you can get from the biography and from the the Crowley books where she's, you know, kind of a Mrs. Doubtfire-esque figure. But you could go with somebody like Maggie Smith, you know, who is the the Dowager Countess in Downton Abbey and Minerva McGonagall in the Harry Potter movies. Or, you know, if you wanted to cast someone and, and start again, with a young Frances Yates, even though she, at the time she's doing this, she was in her 60s, you could go with someone like Karen Gillan, who, you know, has that that kind of sharpness exactly, but she's a little, she's capable of being flinty, but is also sweet and nice. And also, you know, you can feel the intelligence coming off of her on screen. So you could do something like that. It's tricky because if you look at the actresses who are actually in their 60s, they present as much, much younger than they actually are. So you, you sort of have a choice. You, you have to either age somebody up or find someone who's older because, you know, back then, being in your 60s, you were sort of starting to get elderly. And now, in your 60s, you're, you know, at the tail end of middle age. And if you've taken care of yourself and you're, you know, you, you exercise a lot, you can actually be in very good health. So it's a problem. What do you think? Oh, I just cast Meryl Streep, man. I mean, come on. Okay, Meryl Streep. We can do Meryl Streep. <laughs> hey, it's an easy way to get some award season recognition for sure. You know, Yates, I don't know too much about her as a personality to really talk to that. But just from what I know of Maggie Smith, who you just said, I mean, she's got that sort of you know, thin build, I think would be good for somebody like Yates, just from the pictures of Yates that I've seen. And uh, mm-hmm. I, th- I think she's obvious. I mean, she's British, right? So I think that helps just because British actresses have, have such range. So, you know, all in all, I think those are good choices. And I'm, I'm glad you posed those back to me because I was completely unprepared to answer my own questions, which I should probably see. That's, that's what I do. About that's, 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 <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm practiced as a podcast host. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I instantly think, I need to be asking the questions here. (laughs) Hey, I have that problem too. I have been on a couple of podcasts as a guest. I'm always thinking like, first of all, why do you think I'll be a good guest? You know, like I ask questions, I don't answer them. It's a bit of a different role play for sure. You know, so that's right. You've got to be, you've got to be open and you've got to be, you know, when you're, when you're hosting, you know, a, you have just the receptivity. So no matter what your guests say, you sort of go, yeah, I can see that, but I, I could, I could see the world that way. And Definitely. you also have the the unpleasant task at the back end of doing all the editing, which ta- often takes longer than the interview itself. So I don't envy you the, the editing for this. Yeah, it can be a pain in the ass sometimes, for sure. So I think that that is a great introduction to Scott Gosnell, you know, and just the, the standard traditional opening questions can get kind of boring. And, you know, I think people can see that, wow, this is a real person who likes to watch films, knows actors and actresses, you know. But there are people, Scott, who may not know who you are. So let's give them some of the more uh, pertinent deets, as they say on the streets. Tell us a bit about, you know, who Scott Gosnell is by day. What's the Clark Kent part of your life like? So I'm a consultant, and I work a lot with uh, early-stage businesses and entrepreneurs to help them with marketing and finances and and other things like that. Uh, In a previous life, I was a neuroscience researcher. You know, I've done a whole bunch of different things, sales of everything from wine to shares in jets. I've, you know, worked with big banks to help them come up with new products. I've helped healthcare companies navigate the the drug approval process. I've done all these different things, you know, but I sort of started out with, you know, a basic double barrel degree in psychology and economics. And so for whatever reason, I've kind of followed one and then followed the other and worked my way back up to here. It's interesting that in your first question, you had asked, how did I first find out about Bruno, which is 
through the novels of John Crowley, who, you know, he has the Egypt cycle, and you've had him as a guest on here. And one of the things that's really sort of inspiring is, is that he has a really great version of Bruno in there, and he has a lot of references to the art of memory. And that led to me looking up the various books that he references in those novels. And so I start with, you know, Francis Yates' Art of Memory, and then uh, read Ewan Culliano's Magic and Eros in the Renaissance, and a bunch of these other ones. And that leads in turn to asking, well, you know, Yates references all of these Bruno works, where are the translations in English? Because if this guy was actually writing something worth reading, surely someone back in the heyday of the Latin to English translations in the late 19th, early 20th centuries would have done a lot with his works. And if you looked, you found out that, in fact, all of the Italian works had been translated into English, but none of the, with one exception, uh, the Latin works had been translated over completely. So I went on a quest to find some graduate student or faculty member somewhere who was willing to translate first book on the art of memory, which is um, On the Shadows of Ideas, or Dium Brasidiarum, and uh, nobody would do it. They said, oh, I'm terribly busy. You know, If you're willing to pay $20,000, I can certainly whip something up for you. And so in frustration, I ended up learning Latin in the process of doing the translation. And you know, once I had done one, I said, well, why not do another one, and have kept going ever since. You know, I mentioned, like, what's the Clark Kent part of your life like? This is the Superman part of your life. This is your alter ego, that part of you that decided to learn Latin and Italian, I think, right, while translating four volumes of Bruno's works. I mean, if that's not a Superman-esque feat, I don't know what is. But uh, let me just list off the the four volumes that you've translated here. Uh, Book number one in your four-book series so far, uh, you mentioned On the Shadows of Ideas and the Art of Memory. Book two, On the Infinite, the Universe, and the Worlds. Book three, Four Works of Lull, and uh, book four, Thirty Seals, and the Seal of Seals. So what was it about Bruno as a man, as a character, that sparked such interest from you in his work and his life? I get the John Crowley, you know, if you stumbled across those novels and you didn't know who Bruno was prior to that, you would definitely be intrigued by this character. But what was it specifically about Bruno as a man and as a character that, that did spark that interest in you? In the writing, what it was, was that there was a lot of material in it. There's a lot of very colorful images, very strong images in it. If you think of someone like Shakespeare, you think of kind of, it's it's like looking into a jewel box or a box full of chocolates and like finding a lot of stuff in there, a lot of, you know, a lot of nougaty fillings, a lot of fruit and, you know, just wonderful, rich characterization, wonderful, rich people. With Bruno, you have that same image of a cosmos that is infinite and is is teeming with life and with lots of stuff going on. On a, on a human level, I like the fact that there, here was this guy who was sort of, he was a difficult person. I mean, there's, there's just no getting around it. He was just sort of a terribly disaffected and difficult person to be around. I mean, he's the only person that I know of who was excommunicated not only from the Catholic Church, but also by the Calvinists and by the Lutherans. And I hadn't even known that those latter two did excommunication. Currently, for him, they were willing to make an exception. So he was sort of brilliant, and he would he traveled all over Europe. Bruno scholar Dilwyn Knox said, you know, it was like doing the grand tour in reverse. So, you know, a century or two later, you know, young Englishmen would, before they settled down to have a career in law or business or, you know, running the family estate or whatever, the wealthy young Englishmen would go on a tour through France and through Italy and possibly on to Greece to see the sites and to kind of, you know, sow some, some wild oats and also to like see all the architecture and the, and the painting and everything and get their part of their education that way. And so Bruno kind of does the opposite of that. So he flees a monastery in Naples and works his way north into Switzerland and then into France, befriends the king of France and impresses him with this art of memory, gets sent 
uh, away to England because there's a lot of trouble with the Catholics and the, the Huguenots or the Protestants at the time. So they kind of shuffle Bruno off because he is not a standard Catholic priest at this point. They send him off to England. He enjoys himself in England, but after a few years, he ends up having to go back, flees France again, goes off to the various city-states of Germany, and then gets a, an offer to be a private tutor in Venice with a guy who's supposed to teach this guy magic, and the guy ends up turning him into the Inquisition. And that, in turn, leads to an eight-year-long trial and his eventual execution. So it's it's like a really interesting life. He's a he's a traveler. He's a he's somebody who gets seen differently by everybody who sees him. So whether it's historically at the time and shortly after he died, he was seen as being essentially a pagan and someone who was the evilest man in the world. And a couple hundred years later, he's the big hero of science and philosophy and free thinking and the folks who were involved in uh, the Risorgimento in Italy, which is the reunification of Italy, thought of him as a big sort of cultural hero and predecessor. You know, there are other people like Yeats who think of him as a representative of Renaissance magic alongside people like Ficino and uh, John Dee and uh, Edward Kelly and so forth. And even now, if you do Bruno studies, People are constantly saying, no, this is not the right Bruno. You want a different different Bruno. So you have the Bruno who one person, John Bossy, thought Bruno was a spy for uh, Walsingham and you know worked with John Dee and was providing information on the French embassy, which he may or may not have done. You know, he was, uh, at the time when he was in England, he was looking for patrons. Uh, and so who knows how he was trying to make his money at that point. Right, right. So you gave a, a nice overview of Bruno's biography there, and I do want to dig a little deeper into some of these different periods of his life. But before we do that, I'd like to go back to that first Francis Yates book that we mentioned, uh, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. You know, this had a, uh, at least I think it did, it had a nice little role in the the more underground occult revival of the 60s and the 70s. I don't think it was quite mainstream like some of the other occult books and, and you know music was. We've mentioned John Crowley. The book did influence quite a bit of folks, uh, including John. And I've also heard uh, Philip Pullman, a phenomenal British novelist, speak highly of that book as well. What was it about Yeats's book here, this, this first one, that was so important? Why did it have such an impact on so many people, you think? Well, the thing about Yeats is that even if you don't take her hypotheses as proven, she nonetheless has a very good way of kind of putting you at street level in this past time period and making it come alive and making her version of whatever she's talking about be as vivid and as all-encompassing or immersive as you could want. So when you think about her theory of the hermetic tradition being all important in the Renaissance, well, yeah, you can draw you can draw a lot of through lines because apparently a lot of these people were practicing magic and a lot of them were interested in not only the hermetic tradition but also Neoplatonism and the new translations of Plato that Ficino did because they were recovery of, of knowledge but also new knowledge. Right? So if you think about the Renaissance in Italy – this is a time where you have these city-states that are competing with one another. They are all looking for some sort of new technology to one-up. And within the city-states, the families are all looking for ways to one-up each other. And so one of the things is that you get not only from Yeats, but also from Bruno, who was writing within 100 years or so of the time when these first started to appear, you get this feeling of, you know, this is the new tech, this is the hot new thing. So where people today would be talking about neuroscience and quantum mechanics and so forth, these people were talking about, you know, stuff that Plato wrote and that, uh, you know, Plotinus's theory of the great chain of being and the atomic theory that flows off of that. So there was always this sort of search for new knowledge, but also a purer knowledge that would return you to the glories of the past. And John Crowley goes into this in his books where he's like, you know, now 
there's the theme of progress. So everything is getting better all the time, whereas back in the Renaissance, the look was exactly the opposite. So there was a golden period at the dawn of man where everything was great and at peace, and you know they knew what uh, all of the information about the creation of God. And if you know the creation, then you can, through the creation, know God more completely, and, and you're golden. I wonder if Bruno was still alive, if he was alive today. What sorts of topics would he be writing about, you think? You know, I think he would be basically doing popular science work. I think he would be writing a lot about the implications of the discovery of planets circling around other worlds. And he would be writing about the inner worlds that people have. Because I think one of the underappreciated parts of Bruno's work is that he was really trying to do psychology before there was such a thing as psychology. So the, the book that I'm currently working on are his magical essays. And while he has a lot of material in there that is, you know, he has like spirit lists and, you know, how to summon up angels or demons or whatever. He also has a lot more, which is just basic physical theory or what they used to call uh, natural magic or natural philosophy. So natural magic is just natural philosophy applied to something that's really needed. So like magnets were a big subject for the, the natural magic people, because they were, if you think about magnets, you're seeing something where there is a non-obvious source for a physical force that you can plainly see. And so all these guys were terribly interested in magnets. They knew that's how the compass worked, right? And there was a whole big to-do about why do compasses work? Why do they always point to the North Pole? And one group of people said, well, there's a giant magnet, bunch of magnetic mountains sitting up north. And so obviously all the compasses are reacting to that. And some other people said, well, no, it couldn't possibly be that because if that were true, then as your ship sailed north, all of the you know, all of the iron nails in your ship would pull out and, you know, the ship would fall apart. So, yeah, so he would be working on, on, on those kinds of things. And as I said, he also was interested in psychology. So a lot of his work is on how do you affect the emotions and how do the things that magicians do to affect the emotions, so using some kind of magic, how do those equate to the kinds of things that people do who are politicians or orators. So how do they give a speech? And as they're giving the speech, you feel sorrow or you feel happiness or something like that, right? How do they make you become afraid of something? How do they make you become attracted to something? How do salespeople do it? So uh, one of the interesting things that Culiano came up with was that he said, basically, one of the works, which is uh, on bonds in general, he says, essentially, that's the first great work on marketing in the history of the world. And he says, you know, this is how you get your hooks into people and you make them want something really, really bad. And he said, you know, this is a unique look at what Machiavelli was trying to say on a political level. Bruno is saying on a personal level, on a psychological level. But the vocabulary and the way of thinking that we would associate with psychology was not yet fully formed. You know, I read The Prince in college. It was the most difficult book I've ever read, and it's like 90 pages long. Have you read that? Yes, I have. If you want difficult, you should try reading uh, Heidegger's Being and Time. I was having a conversation with some people uh, online about that a couple weeks back, and they had said, oh yeah, this is, this is a really complicated, if you want really complicated philosophy, this is the book for you. And they said most of the people who are Heidegger experts recommend spending at least a decade with it before you can really get a grip on it. And of course, this was one of the books that my fre one of my freshman German teachers assigned us alongside some of the, the hermetic literature and some of the other, uh, other related things in a, uh, in a course. And this was a few weeks into the school year. And, you know, this book is very complex. And I said, I, I can't make heads or tails of this, you know, at 18 years old. 
And, you know, I said, I must, I must really be stupid. And we get, you know, I get into class and I'm like, what, what did, what did you get out of this thing? And the other people said, I don't know what, what, what the guy was talking about. And, you know, and he said, well, maybe it's just a bad translation. So he went over to the library and looked it up in German. And he said, no, it's even worse in German than it is in English. But the Prince, yeah, the Prince is a, it's a great classic. You can't really take the lessons of the Prince to be useful to you in your daily life, but you can take it as a really good examination of how to be ruthless if you happen to live in Renaissance Italy. And you can take those lessons and the opposite lessons and combine them and come up with something that's quite a bit stronger. So it's not a complete philosophy, but it's a, it's a nice one. Or not a nice one, but a, a, a useful one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm not sure how much of it I have consciously retained, but yeah, maybe there's some subconscious retainment of the ideas in there for sure. So I wanted to chunk out some bits of Bruno's biography because I think it'll allow us to, to see how you know he evolved as a person over time and then also how his ideas evolved. And I just wanted to start with his life Prior to his ordination in 1572, what was noteworthy or, you know, intriguing or thought-provoking about Bruno's life up to that point? So he was the child of a mercenary soldier and was, you know, grew up poor in the south of Italy in Nola, which is outside of Naples, on the slopes of Mount Cicada or Cicala. And you know, had a really ordinary childhood, was clearly one of the brightest boys in the village, and, you know, learned how to read and write. And they said, oh, this is very bright. So they got him a scholarship, essentially, to go join this monastery and, you know, become a, a monk and then a priest. And he goes to this place, which is in Naples, but it is essentially, it's a the Renaissance version of a research institute. So all the bright young men who are there are there to study and do some work. And, you know, and then they, a lot of them who are noble or who are, who have some money coming in from the family as an allowance will go out and raise hell and drink and, and do other things, even though they have taken vows. So there was quite a lot of that. And Bruno gets in trouble because he, like all of them, has a whole bunch of icons and religious statuary and pictures of saints and things in his room. And he takes down everything but the crucifix. And there are several theories for why he did this. And one of them is, is that he was using the walls of his room as locations for his art of memory, which the Dominicans, which he was a member, that was their big claim to fame, that they had this classical art that they could use to do off-the-cuff sermons or speeches that could last for hours. And he rapidly became known as one of the best performers in this art and, you know, gets shown off to the Pope at one point. But yeah, so he has, he starts out, he has trouble because he's, A, taken down all of these, these images of saints and things, and B, he starts reading more and more questionable literature. So he gets caught with a copy of Erasmus, who was a reformer in the Netherlands, and who was one of the people responsible for developing uh, humanistic education as it is even to this day. But that was seen as being possibly Protestant-inflected literature. It was seen as being possibly heretical although Erasmus himself didn't particularly have a lot of problems with the church, or either personally or in his writing. Nonetheless, the church sometimes had problems with Erasmus. He also, we think, was reading a lot of, a lot of magical books. So he certainly read the Picatrix. At some point, he read Agrippa, and he read uh, the Heptameron, and he read a bunch of other things. But you know, and eventually he gets caught with this and he gets the warning that, you know, they're going to be coming for him and they're going to take him down and, and interrogate him. And he slips out of the monastery, changes his clothes, gets out of the monastery and runs away and 
gets passed hand to hand by all of these people who are dissidents from the church and eventually makes his way out of Italy. That's the early part. That's that's the yeah. kind of nutshell version. So you mentioned the art of memory, and I want to go back to Yeats for a moment. The second book that we mentioned that she wrote called The Art of Memory, and I guess I'll pose a same question to you as I did about the first one. You know, what what was it about this book of hers that made it so important to people who read it that made such an impact on them? Again, I think it's it's one of those books that makes you want to try out the technique that's being described. And I think it's one of those that, again, is like a jewel box. So like, it's just so vivid, so brilliant, written with such engagement in the topic that you say, you know, this is just a fantastic thing. You know, if you encounter the art of memory kind of by itself, it's, it seems kind of plain and ordinary and, you know, slightly boring. And you say, well, why don't you just take notes or, you know, have a filing cabinet instead? Or, you know, keep it all on your laptop. But if you read Yeats, you think, oh, this is, you know, this is fantastic. This is how having a having a, a memory palace can not only be like a reminder list for your groceries, but can also be the entryway to having a rich inner life. So you can visualize all of these places, all of your memories, whether they were at first part of the memory palace or not, you can use this enhanced power of imagination to create an inward universe that, if you're Bruno, right, was meant to reflect the entirety of the outer universe. And so if you have this, then what does that do to you as a person? And to the extent that it did something for Bruno, right, it made him a very interesting and lively person, gave him this rich inner life, did the same thing for Yeats, even though she may not have used the technique as much as Bruno did. So you have this kind of vibrant inner life that then is reflected outwardly. You feel it and you see it in the person who has this capability. So we mentioned that Bruno gets excommunicated. He gets slapped with that heretic label, which to me is like the highest form of accomplishment. And after that, he spends... The next few years, just wandering around Europe, you know, not staying too long in any one place. And this is the first of two nomadic phases in his life. And during this first one, what were the high points here? What was noteworthy? Because it it seems like this is when he really starts to develop his cosmology and his ideas. So he leaves Italy and goes to France He gets a degree at the University of Toulouse, which, depending on who you ask, was a master's degree or a doctorate. He always claimed it was a doctorate. And then goes from there to visit the the king of France, King Henry III, and produces for him an example of the art of memory and also writes his first book on the shadows of ideas, which has not only the art of memory in it, but also uses everything from actual physical buildings to imagined buildings. And then he goes on and has astrological and astronomical images and says, you know, you can essentially set an infinite number of images into the sky like you would with constellations. He gets an appointment to be a lecturer at a private college sponsored by the king and hangs out with him. And the king asks, you know, is this magic or is this art? And he says, oh, it's definitely it's art. And Yeats had the theory that what he was really saying was it's a magical art, but it's a, it's a licit art. It's an, it's a permitted art within the church. So if you can think again about what the rulers and the elite in the Renaissance were trying to do, they were always looking for these new technologies that would enhance their capabilities. And if you're the king, being able to remember everything you see or having people who can remember everything that they see has a lot of potential uses. So one of those is in spycraft. So if you have a bunch of ambassadors who go to events or do other things in foreign courts and then can report back to you word for word what everyone is saying, that's very handy. Likewise, if you're the king, and you have this really excellent memory technique, then you can 
sort of have your kingdom in your pocket. You can know where everything is. You can know when someone is trying to fool you because you remember something else that they said six months before that contradicts their description of it now. You can essentially know what's going on in your in your country in the past. And if you know what's in the past, you know what's in the present. So this is a huge thing for any ruler to have. And there were techniques that were built up during the Middle Ages, specifically called the notary art, where you were supposed to be able to look at images and have those images inform your mind spiritually with knowledge of the seven liberal arts or with the ability to do various divinations or other things. And those were regarded by the church as being unwholesome and illicit. But the art of memory had not been had not received that same stain. The other thing that Bruno does during that time is he starts to get interested in the techniques of a guy named Ramon Lull, who was a Catalan mystic who lived uh, about four centuries before. And when you use the Lullian art, you can take the memory arts, project the images forward, and start making guesses about what's going to happen now and in the future. So you're essentially using what we would call logic, but you're also taking the art of memory and making it from a retrospective art into a prospective art. So you can accurately predict or understand what things are going to happen. Yeah, so it was during this time then that you know he did publish several books. You mentioned On the Shadows of Ideas. He, he published that. He published The Art of Memory. He published Circe's Song, which I don't know much about. And he also published, I think, like a like a play of sorts, right? Called The uh, Torchbearer. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Il Candelayo, which is either The Torchbearer or The Candlebearer, which is kind of an interesting play. Now, Circe was, the Song of Circe was something that he wrote because people read his first book and they said, wow, that's, that's really complicated. And even people who read it today say, wow, that's, that's, there's a lot in there. And I don't know if I could ever use that much. So he said, all right, I'll write you the, the simpler version. And in Circe, he does a set of just 30 images and says, okay, here's how you can take these 30 images and attach the images of people who you know to them. And to make those images of the people that you know really simple, you transform those people into different animals. So, you know, somebody who's studious and has a big pair of glasses, you turn into an owl. Someone who is, you know, who is sort of big and strong, but not terribly bright, maybe you turn them into a bear. And you put them in each of these 30 locations so that you can remember, for example, everyone who is at a dinner party. Now, the candle bearer is an interesting play because you know it deals with human relations it's kind of a i wouldn't know how to describe it it's it's a fairly cynical cynical but also blackly funny play you know written about the naples of his time i have a question about that in a minute and it, it does tie into what i want to get to now so after this period bruno arrives in England at some point. I'm not sure what year exactly because I've actually seen a couple of different dates, but I think that's sort of irrelevant. But when he gets to England, what's notable about his time here? Because we get into some really nice, juicy speculation about, you know, who he may have crossed paths with during this time that I think would be worth noting as well. Yeah, so he gets to England and like I said, he's in the he's in the entourage of the French ambassador, uh, Mauvissier. And while he's there, he we know that he meets with a large number of courtiers and the intelligentsia of England. He goes off and gives a guest lecture at Oxford, where they kind of mistreat him and laugh him out off the stage, in part because his Latin is pronounced in the Italianate way. And so they make wisecracks about him talking about the circumference of a trickle uh, instead of the circumference of a circle. But He's much better received among uh, the courtiers, so he's friends with Sir Philip Sidney. He, in one of his dialogues, he's talking with uh, Folk Greville, who was a, a mover and shaker of the day. And there's also speculation that he might have either met Shakespeare or at least influenced Shakespeare. Shakespeare might have read him 
or something like that. But we know that he was, if anything, no more than two degrees of separation from Shakespeare or D or some of these other characters who were who were running around at the time. Now, on the one side, you have the kind of proto-scientists or natural philosophers of the day, like Diggs, who actually had probably the best version of the cosmological system of anybody, and who likewise was interested in magnets and in all these other other uh, marvels of nature that the, the scientists or the natural philosophers of the day were interested in. So the question is, is whether, in fact, he did meet with Shakespeare as the John Crowley books, they have them meet. He has him meet with Dee. And I would certainly say that meeting with Dee would be a plausible thing because Dee had the huge library and had a running stream of people who would come by to read his books or borrow his books or look at them. And if you can tell nothing else about Bruno, you would know that he read compulsively. I mean, he was the kind of guy who would read the cereal box if there was nothing else available. But Shakespeare is interesting because there are a couple of plays that have bits in them that are suggestive of Bruno. So one is Love's Labor's Lost. There's a character called Baron or Biron, who is one of the king's gentlemen and is both a little bit brighter than the other gentleman, but also is kind of a he's kind of a jerk. So this would, you know, line up well with Bruno and also uh, Brown sounds like Brown, and Bruno is also a name that means brown, and uh, it also means bear. So there was Bruno the bear, who was a character in uh, like the Reynard the Fox stories and different things, but. So there's a question as to whether he, he's actually part of the inspiration for that character, also because that guy gets a big speech about how, you know, love is behind everything and love is the greatest thing ever. And he goes off and is, is trying to seduce this woman in the middle of having sworn chastity along with the other gentleman and the king for three years. And, uh, you know, is then at the end of it sentenced to take his, his rapier wit and cheer up people who are ill or depressed until the, the end of the, the mourning period for the princess who's the main romantic interest in the, in the story. There's also a little bit in Hamlet where you know, Hamlet says, you, know, you could trap me in a nutshell and I would count myself the king of infinite space. Hey, sorry to cut in here, but as you may have noticed, our connection is a bit inconsistent volume-wise. I did my best to make those sections louder without losing quality, but this one didn't work out so well, so I wanted to share that Hamlet line that Scott quoted because it's pretty pertinent here. The line Scott threw out is this, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams. And you can see how that would relate to Bruno's cosmology of infinite space, which I think Scott is going to talk more about right about now. And because Bruno was the guy who said, you know, space is infinite and really pushed that idea, it, there's a theory that that was it. And also, if you go through that scene, there's a whole bit about dreaming and how dreams are nothing but shadows and how life is but a shadow. And so you then get this reference to. Uh, on the shadows of ideas. So, did Shakespeare read this, or did he, you know did it reach him by diffusion through somebody else? We don't know. Uh, but there are these little tantalizing connections, and we have nothing at all about the actual communication that might have happened to them. Bruno was in England from about 1582 to 1585, which is when those early works, the Circe and the rest of these were all being published for the first time. You know, we don't know what he was doing from day to day, except when he's mentioned by somebody, and he's mentioned about three times in the surviving literature, and then what he tells people that he was doing. So he knew, you know, he, he knew all of these people, and Shakespeare knew all of these people, but we don't know that he knew Shakespeare. Yeah, so, you know, to that Shakespeare point and to the D point, it is curious that, I mean, this is the time 
of Bruno's life where he is writing about this infinite cosmos. He's really developing this theory. He's publishing these books on it. And you do see that in Hamlet, like you said, which was published after Bruno's death. So, you know, Shakespeare would have had time to read that and process it and definitely work it into the writing. You know, if Shakespeare was indeed one man that that he met, which, uh, you know, that, that's a whole other conversation, right? But I am curious, though, you know, the the, de- the possible deconnection or meeting is interesting. And, you know, considering who all he came across while he was here in England, how did Bruno's thinking and ideas evolve from coming across these characters? Because it's easy to say and see in some of them that Bruno had an effect on their ideas. But what sort of effect did this time in England have on his ideas? Wow, uh, that's a good, that, that's a very good question. And it's not one that I've put a lot of thought into. So I apologize. But I think there are some stylistic things. One of the things that that did influence him heavily was he was a big fan of Queen Elizabeth. So he thought of her as being this monarch representing the reformation of the political scene in Europe. And while there's a lot of argument over how political Bruno actually was, you can certainly tell that he was not a big fan of the Catholic Church. He was not a big fan of some of the more repressive monarchs of the day. He was a big fan of, of Queen Elizabeth, wrote some poetry and other things which are very favorable toward her. And, you know, this was this was a common theme among the, I guess, the, the writers of the day in England. So he, he, you know, he was part of that. He was influenced by their work in praise of Elizabeth, their work stylistically as well because I think it was very compatible with him. Again, using a lot of rich imagery, rich verbal language, adorning the, you know, even the serious philosophical works with, you know, poetry to, to represent particularly compact versions of the, the overarching philosophical ideas of a treatise. So you see this even with something like the alchemical texts, texts of the day. So not only were you expected to be able to do these alchemical operations with essentially applied chemistry, but you know you would attach to them beautiful woodcut images that are puzzling and interesting and very vivid. You are expected to do the same kind of imagery in poetic form and hide the actual procedure within the poem. And so we know that he was heavily influenced by, you know, I think he was, it was influenced by the, the literature and the art of the day. And certainly there are a few periods of time when there was better art and literature and performance available than during that era in England. If you only had Shakespeare, you would be doing very well. But you also have people like Marlowe. You also have, you know, like there is a huge flowering of new work being made. So I think he, you know, I think he ate all that up. Right. And if he's getting into alchemical thought, then that seems to be a direct correlation to, to John Dee's work and, and the work. Yeah. I don't know if he actually was into alchemy at all. I just know that if you look at the images that are created for alchemical purposes, which are, they're essentially disguising the underlying theme of what these various reagents and chemicals are doing. But when you look at the emblem books that have these in them, right, or you look at the alchemical texts that have them in them, they are exactly the kind of images that you would want to have for a memory palace. So, you know, you think about all of those kings being melted down in a bath, green dragons or green lions and, and black dragons and all of these things. And that's the same vividness, and it takes advantage of the same psychological principles. So that's why people find that, you know, it's really fun to look at alchemical texts, even if you don't know or aren't thinking about how do we volatilize gold? How do we, you know, how do we transmute silver into gold, iron into silver? But those images and that weird art kind of thing, it sticks in your mind. 
and it sticks in your mind for the same reasons that he outlines in the art of memory. So they're they're sort of parallel developments. Weirdly, he was not somebody who had particularly great illustrations in his books. And where he does have good illustrations, they tend to have been copied from other people's books that the you know their publisher had had left over or had used in another book and reused in his books. His own woodcuts were fairly simple, so that's you know neither here nor there. I'm a John D fan for some reason. You know, I have the same affinity for D that I have for Bruno because it was, you know, through John Crowley's novels that I discovered both. So I hold them up. I don't know. I don't know if I say in high regard, but I, I just, I find their lives so fascinating. So the prospect of them possibly meeting and, you know, D would have had all those all chemical texts in his library that, that you referenced earlier. So that seems to me like just an exciting prospect to speculate about. And I did have one more question about this part of, of Bruno's life. You know, we mentioned this possible connection and influence on Shakespeare. And, you know, in that play that we mentioned, the uh, Torchbearer or the Candlebearer, I know it has a, a couple different translations probably, but I saw some essays written about the influence of that on Hamlet specifically. But I haven't read the Torchbearer, so I, I can't really speak to this. But I'm wondering, I assume you've read it and I, I assume you've read Hamlet. Do you see any direct influence you know, I have not read the Candlebury. Uh, yeah, well, I haven't. I haven't read the so. Candlebury yet, so I only know about it secondhand. Yeah, and I, I don't know anything about the connection between the two. So that's fine. That's what, fine. What have I you heard just, about it? It was just a. I found found an essay on it, and it was very. Uh, I want to say it was short. I mean, it. Uh, I guess it was kind of short, but it was a collection of essays about Bruno that were sort of thrown into a book. And the title of the book. Let me find it real quick. It's called A Primer to Giordano Bruno, New Age Prophet, Mystic, and Heretic by Julia Jones. Oh, yeah. Julia was the, was the person who I worked on the movie with. No so for a, while, okay. for a while, we were going to develop either a documentary or a feature film on Culiano story. So I don't know if you, you, you've read about him yet, but Ion Culiano was a... Romanian academic who was, among other things, an expert on Bruno. So he wrote um, Magic and Eros in the Renaissance and basically was very interested in Bruno and Dee and all these things. was a protege of Mircea Eliade and um, came to the University of Chicago after having got three different doctorates over in Europe and uh, was a brilliant guy interested in all of this renaissance magic and renaissance thought and then he was murdered and the belief is that he was murdered by the securitat secret police over in romania this was after the fall of Ceausescu, and so we were going to make a movie around this and you know you were talking about casting at the beginning of the the episode and uh we were thinking. We were trying to figure out who should play uh, Culiano. We were leaning towards Sebastian Stan because you know he's also got Romanian heritage, and, you know, and is also one of those people who can do very intense, very intelligent characters as well, which is a rare talent. So I'm sorry. What we what was the original question? I, I went off on a tangent. I'm not really sure now. Oh, oh, yeah. I had asked you if you had read the Candle Bearer and. If it had a direct oh, yes, on Hamlet, so yes, so Julia Jones, yes, so yeah, she, Julia. she she would be the one to ask about the the Hamlet connection. Yeah. So after I had read John Crowley's Egypt Cycle, the first work that I sought out, I didn't seek out Bruno's works. I sought out books about him, and Julia's was the very first one that I read. I don't know anything about Julia or this book other than that it exists and and I read it. So I, I don't know if it has a reputation about it, because it, it's pretty short. And th that's why I thought, like, it seemed like just a group of, like, sort of small chapter, like, like essay-type writings that were just kind of thrown into a book. But so I, I wasn't really sure if it was if it was all accurate or not. So, you know, I'm sure you've read it then. What What is Julia's I work I have read it, about? and it was several years ago, so I, I'm afraid I don't have it fresh in mind. Well, that's fair, man. That's fair. Yeah, I, I read it probably three years ago, too, so I haven't revisited it since. But 
I still have it somewhere in here. I pulled it out the other day and I can't find it now. And I, I had just made some notes about it uh, in prep for the conversation here. But you know, let's get back into just the Bruno timeline real quick as we, you know, we're kind of winding our time down here. So Bruno leaves England and he finds himself nomadic. He's in that second nomadic phase of his life. He's got the Inquisition creeping in on him. But before they get to him, is there anything significant about this period prior to his imprisonment? So he has the whole period that's in Germany. And if you look at the writing that he does during that period, that seems to be where he was happiest. He seems to have been well received. He had a lot of, you know, adoring students because, you know, he was, again, like it was like having your bad boy professor who was your astronomy or your, your mathematics professor who would teach you these basic things as an undergraduate. And who also had this kind of cool technique for here's how you can ace all of your exams, right? Here's how you can memorize all of this stuff that you have to memorize for when you're doing the the big oral presentation. And, you know, it's apparent that a lot of them liked him. You know, he, his later works were written down, the ones that were published posthumously were written down by uh, Andreas Bessler and uh, he and his brother Hieronymus would later go on, and they were both doctors and and, and natural philosophers. One of them wrote a really elaborate book on horticulture and and keeping flowers, and were very influential in the the court there in, uh, in Germany. So he had a great time there. Eventually, though, he basically ran out of money and got into bad odor uh, with the local minister who, you know, thought he was an evil person and horrible and, you know, he got into arguments and no doubt called the guy a, you know, a mendicant and a fool. So, because he would get in fights with people for basically no reason. So he ends up having to get out of there. He gets an offer for someone to go and teach the art of memory and also his magical techniques to this guy named uh, Juan Mochenego down in Venice and teaches the guy for a while, tutors him, and then the guy locks him in the attic and calls the Inquisition uh, in Venice. The Venetians take a while to kind of mull over what they should do with him because, A, they were not really fond of turning people over to the Roman Inquisition because they were Venice and they thought, we do things our way around here. But they said, okay, this guy isn't a Venetian, and and the Roman Inquisition is always pestering us to turn somebody over, so we might as well get rid of this guy. The other thing is, is that there's some suspicion that he was very well connected politically, and we don't really have a clear picture as to like how well connected he was or whether, you know, but they didn't have a clear picture either. So the Venetians hold on to him while they wait and figure out how loudly the various kings and dukes and so forth in Germany are going to complain if they actually do imprison. So they use him as a bargaining chip, send him off to Rome. He goes on trial in front of several people, one of whom is Cardinal Bellarmine. Robert Bellarmine is now, I believe, a saint. You know, And back then, he was the hot up-and-coming cardinal. Think of him as the young district attorney who gets this high-profile case and so he prosecutes Bruno. Now, Bellarmine was interesting because he was sort of the moderating voice in that trial. And later, 20 years later, he gets involved with Galileo and is, is kind of more cautionary, but not, not harsh with Galileo. And some of the thought is, is that it's because the whole trial with Bruno and then subsequent execution left a bad taste in his mouth. You know, it, it was something that looked like a good idea at the time. And it turned out that it was not really a spectacular success. So there's some thinking that he regretted it in his later years. But yeah, so they have an eight year long trial, which seems like a long time to me. And I, you know, I don't know how long that is in Roman Inquisition terms in the renaissance but you know they can't all have taken eight years to actually go through the whole process and so during that trial he has a number of charges levied against him 
one of which is the, the idea of the eternity and plurality of worlds. So he claims that the universe is infinitely old and is, you know, and that all of the stars up in the sky have planets going around them and all those planets have people on them. And you can imagine that would mean either ours is the only world that got got Jesus Christ on it, and so all of those people are damned, or you know, some effort is going to have to be made to go and reach everybody else. Or they've all got, you know, they've all been visited by Jesus, and then you've got a real problem, theologically speaking. But that was kind of one of the lesser charges. There were some other ones that were, you know, that he had blasphemed. And I think it was Ingrid Rowland who pointed out that, you know, everybody in Italy blasphemed 200 times a day because that that's how you swore. And she says, you know, even today in Naples, then as now, like, pig god is, a, you know, is a common epithet. So you, you know, porco dio, or if you were uh, in Ireland, it was in Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, right? So all of those things are kind of minor charges, but then he also had ones that were things that they said that he'd questioned the divinity of Jesus, you know, said that he was no more than a magician and that Moses was better at it, questioned the virginity of the Virgin Mary, you know, all of these different things. And they couldn't, basically couldn't decide whether he was a heretic like the Lutherans or a heretic like the pagans and tried to get him to uh, renounce all of these heresies. He says, sure, any of the theological ones you want, I will renounce. And any of the philosophical ones, he says that, you know, that's a matter of private conscience and I can't do it. Now, the church itself was not on the cosmological things, it was not particularly against people making speculations that the you know that the earth revolved around the sun or that there were other planets or that anything like that you could do it but you had to make very very clear that this was not something that you had derived from the evidence unless you had evidence for it you know so you had to say i am speculating that perhaps you know this might be so and you know that's also what got Gal- galileo in trouble so Galileo got, got in trouble on what was called vehement suspicion of heresy, which is different from what Bruno supposedly did, which was pertinacious heresy, which is actually having false beliefs and actually you know, promoting those beliefs and then being reprimanded for it and continuing in your false beliefs. So essentially, he argued with them for eight years until they got tired of it and ended up ordering him to be executed. And so they burned him at the stake in the middle of the flower market, you know, and where you can still see a statue of him that was put up with his back to the Vatican. (laughs) Pretty appropriate. Absolutely. So, you know, the church denied burning him at the stake until 1846. That's like almost 250 years that they blatantly lied about killing someone. And that seems like business as usual for the church from my perspective, but I am curious as to why you think they lied about this for so long. I mean, 250 years is several generations of people who, you know, you would think like just wouldn't really be affected by Bruno and his work and his ideas, but why did they keep lying about it for so long? I think that it kind of put a bad taste in their mouth. You know, even the people who are kind of gung ho to essentially it happened in the backdrop of, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. So there's a big political and religious struggle going on. And they said, you know, surely the way that we do away with this is we kill all the heretics, you know, because they are wicked people who, even if you tell them how wrong they are, will not admit it. And so they do various wretched things to people. And, you know, at the same time, this is still Christianity, and it's still a lot of these people were highly educated, were cosmopolitan, you know, they were involved in everything that he was involved in. They just didn't get caught about it, or they were not so hostile in their delivery of some of these ideas. So, you know, and this is the bishops and cardinals and 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 the people in the curia are there are people doing magic. There are people doing 
astrological speculation. There are people doing, you know, early astronomy and, and alchemy and all of these other things. And so while they were upset with him, actually executing someone for that and burning him at the stake did not, it, it wasn't a big PR triumph and it wasn't a big moral triumph. And so, you know, it was one of the things that I think they weren't particularly proud of and they didn't really want to trumpet it after they had been subtly and quietly scolded for it. You notice that there are no other cases that can really be thought of where the Catholic Church burned a philosopher or scientist or academic at the stake between then and now. You know, they would reprimand them, they would put them under house arrest for a while, they would make them renounce certain works of theirs or certain ideas of theirs, but they stopped executing them. And so if you do that, you may also decide you want to revise history a little bit and say, oh no, you know, we would never do, we would never execute anyone in the first place. That would be a terrible thing, right? Burning someone at the stake for his ideas. Now, it's interesting that one of Bruno's cellmates was a guy who was, it was another priest, was involved in basically trying to overthrow the Catholic Church, was involved in, you know, some peasant uprisings, and they ended up burning him as well. So there's some thought that, that there was also a political element to it. They thought that Bruno was forming a secret society, but essentially the reason that they wouldn't talk about it for, for hundreds of years was because, you know, it was, it was embarrassing. So you messaged me privately on the Twitter. One thing you told me that was that Bruno's work fits into what you described as one of your big overarching preoccupations, which is the transformations of ideas over time and the ways in which ideas transform the people who have them. So I'm just curious, you know, how can we apply these transformations to Bruno the man, Bruno the mystic? You know, how do you see him transforming over time? And how do you see his ideas transforming over time? Wow. Well, the interesting thing is historically, as I said, he has had a number of incarnations. So he starts out being the heretic who gets burned at the stake right, and is a horrible man. His ideas, therefore, are plainly false. Otherwise, right, the Catholic Church would not have been proven right and would not have executed him. But then people start to realize that, you know, those ideas were the correct ones, that the Copernican revolution, you know, happens, that it's that Galileo proves it to be true through use of the telescope, that planets are actually worlds of their own. And then, you know, in modern times, we now have even more proof that his perception that the universe is, or at least very, very large, and is populated by, you know, suns like our own with planets like our own, that actually proved out. And, you know, his other ideas about how do you populate your inward life are extremely useful. So having this inner landscape that you can visit, whether it's through dreaming or lucid dreaming, through active imagination, through remembering as intensely as you can pieces of your life that have gone by. So recollecting what childhood was like, or recollecting people who are gone, and having these memories of them that are strong enough that you can reach out and touch them. That's a very handy thing to have, and it's a very life-affirming and enriching thing to have. So the more you have going on in you, the more you have to produce and to create things in the world. The other thing is, is that his vision of a world that is essentially that love makes the world go round. So he says, you know, all of these forces reduce ultimately to love and to hate. And he says, and then hate reduces to love ultimately. And love is the thing that makes the planets go around. Love is the thing that keeps you alive and that populates all the animals. And then he sort of has the other side of it, which is that, you know, love is the thing that energizes the soul. And he says, and everything has a soul. Everything is alive. Everything is moving, you know, and there's no end to it. It's all bits and pieces and particles floating around. And there's a great soul in the universe. And, you know, there are smaller souls that are in particular parts of it. 
and the great soul is in every part of it, but not in every part of it equally or in the same way. So that's a vision of universal harmony and universal life that can be taken and can be brought into your own life. Man, I can't. First of all, you took the very last question out of my mouth with Bruno's idea of, of love, because that is a, I know you've heard the show, I don't know how many shows you've heard, but love is a, a theme that runs through it pretty consistently. So it's nice that you threw that out there. You know, my last question for you, Scott, is going to tie this back to the very beginning. Are there any Giordano Bruno appearances in comic books? Because I can never find one. I have not seen them. There are some Italian comics. Uh, so if you go to uh, Guido Giudice's site, which is, I think, GiordanoBruno.info, he has a lot of information on all of the appearances of Bruno in literature, in comics, in movies, because they, they made a movie about him a while back. But yeah, that would be the place to look. And I know I know there were some... He doesn't appear very much in, in English language comics or literature at all, which, you know, will have to change. <laughs> you know, he was in he was in the Cosmos, the new Cosmos series, but it was a sort of strange version of him that, you know, took some shortcuts that probably were not warranted based on what we know about. Him. So we'll have to find we'll have to find some ways to, to get to get him back into English language literature. You know, I think I may want to take it upon myself then to to write this Bruno comic book because I mean, if you think about it, you know, magic, heresy, the ideas of the infinite cosmos, uh, memory, weaving relationships in with D and Shakespeare. I mean, that just sounds like a great story, and it's also great because it already has an ending. You don't have to work too hard. Speaking of that, though, I do think that we should tell people where they can find more of you and your work before we go here. So I mentioned sure. the, the four books up front. Where can people find those and where can they find your podcast as well? So uh, people can find the, the four Bruno books, soon to be five, at Amazon.com. You can find me at BottleRocketScience.net. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Infinite underscore me. Or you can just look up my name, and uh, I, I generally show up in the first few uh, first few answers. We will have all that linked in the show notes for everybody, definitely. So, Scott Gazano, thanks so much for your time. Would love to talk to you again when that fifth Bruno book comes out. Great, sounds good. Thanks for having me. And there you have it. My thanks again to Scott Gosnell. Check out the show notes for all the pertinent links if you're interested in learning more about Scott's work or the work of Giordano Bruno. A bit of a different episode here too, both from me and about Bruno. I've heard Scott talk at length about Bruno and his cosmology, the ideas found in his work, but I am a fan of what used to be called narrative nonfiction or narrative biographies. I never quite got the terminology there because if you're writing a book, it's already inherently a narrative. But regardless, I wanted to replicate that style and format here because I find the story behind the ideas and the man behind the ideas infinitely more fascinating than the ideas themselves. There's something about being human and diving into context that drives me crazy in a weird sort of fetishy way. I have a fetish for context, I guess. And I hope after listening to this that you have a fetish for Bruno, because his work is definitely worth fetishizing. And speaking of fetishes, if you have a cool t-shirt fetish, we're down to single digits of our first t-shirt and we just sold out of large tees. We're also down to just one 2X shirt, a couple smalls and a couple mediums, and I think about 4XLs. So if you were on the fence and your size is still in stock, check out oculturepodcast.com slash merch or our Etsy shop. Both are linked in the show notes. Also linked in the show notes is our Patreon campaign, which continues to grow. We're up to 30 patrons now and actually also at 30% of our first monthly goal, which is going to help me upgrade the hardware and software to this show. A couple shout-outs to Kevin and Edward for hopping on board recently. And also a huge thank you to Carter, Mauricio, and Alyssa, who all became official executive producers of the show by jumping in at the $10 and $20 levels, respectively. You guys will find your name in the show notes of every episode from here on out. Also, a huge thank you to Joe for his recent one-time donation of $100. It's much appreciated, Joe. And my thanks to everyone else out there who chooses to download this show every week. Like I always say, dollars or downloads, it's all appreciated and it all helps. We could use some more five-star reviews on iTunes too, so if you're listening through there or the Apple Podcasts app, give us a nice rating and leave a comment or two if you'd like. That also helps tremendously. 
But that is it for me this time around. Thanks again for being here. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh,